It's time for Talking Pines, live here in Westminster, and I'm joined by the Member of Parliament for Thirsk and Moulton for the Conservative Party, Kevin Hollingrake. Kevin, welcome to Talking Cheers. Pines. Very good to see nice you. To see you, Nigel. Now, I'm pleased to say, unlike many, not just in your party, but many that I've criticised over my years in, involved with politics, you actually had a business life before yeah. you even got involved in politics at all. Yeah, I did. Uh, 30 years actually in business and very small business building up to a larger business uh, became a national business. So I love that life and I still miss it, to be honest. It's, um, I think most members of parliament bring something to parliament from their past lives. And, and I, I, you know, it does is something I'm able to talk on probably more confidently yeah. um, due to that business experience. And, and um, <laughs> really, I, I spend most of my time in Parliament trying to represent the interests of SMEs, which I think are truly the lifeblood of the economy. Yeah, no, I do too. And I felt that in the European Parliament. You know, I'd run mm. my own company for nine years. I'd worked for bigger firms before that. I felt it gave me an advantage. Mm. What, what do the Oxbridge set bring to politics that comes straight in from their university degrees, into research offices, MPs in their late 20s. What do they bring? Well, they'll bring something. But I well, was, I, well, I'm I, asking you, what is it? <laughs> well, they're, they're some very bright people, of course. Oh, but, right. Um, I think we're it's member, members of Parliament, and there aren't that many people who have come straight in from doing absolutely nothing. Um, but I think more in the officials you see that, people who haven't had some real-world experience. And um, so I think it's good, I say to any per young person thinking of entering politics, go and do something else first. Get experience. It could be mm. medicine, it could be the military, it could be business, whatever else. But get some real-world experience because the world looks very differently, uh, very different when you have. So, um, so they can bring stuff and the, uh, the knowledge of the system and how to, how to make the system work. You're so on. diplomatic. <laughs> you really, I know you don't well, mean it. But. Well... So, uh, it, so, so for you, it, it was a state agency, wasn't it? It was, yes. So is it the sort of two least popular professions in the world, yes. the politicians and the state agents? Yes, I think I'm the only person who's entered politics and improved my social standing. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, was an it gave me a thick skin, which you need in politics as well, of And course. what made you go into politics? I always wanted to, you know, as a, as a young teenager. Dad was a businessman, farmer, milkman, and uh, mum was a social worker, rehabilitated offenders. Um, found jobs and places to live and uh, we used to talk about uh, my sister a bit older than me was studying politics at Manchester Uni when I was about 12 or 13 so she'd always have some really radical ideas about how the world should be run uh, lots of Marxist ideas and stuff like that which she doesn't subscribe to anymore um, so I, I found it very interesting and we used to debate this stuff properly around the dining room yeah. table like you did like yeah, yeah, sometimes so, do so yeah politics very much in the blood yeah now since 2019 you know, as a Yorkshireman representing a seat quite a long way up, there weren't many Conservatives from the north of England there. It must have been relatively lonely. And since 2019, there's quite a lot of you, isn't there? Yes, I mean, it's great to see. You play, uh, seats like Darlington, Peter Gibson, or Deanna Davidson, Bishop Auckland, uh, uh, Paul Howells, Sedgefield. Winning seats like that was a really historic moment. And, and it wasn't just the fact we won them, it was the... It was the the welcome we were receiving on those doorsteps in those areas, you could see the world had changed, the demographics had changed. And it, clearly it was Boris, it was Brexit, it was, yeah. um, it, it was uh, Jeremy Corbyn had a big impact. But there is there's something more fundamental than that. So I think we need to keep, we can't take those seats for granted, but the, we want to be looking to keep the red wall blue for many well, decades Well, I know, that's what you want to do. Yeah, that's right, I think um, we can, though. That's what you want to do, but I'm just wondering... We've got a cost of living crisis. I mean, it's, it's been with us. It's been with us already for a few months. Yeah. But those bills are going to land, aren't they? Those yep. bills are going to land in just a few weeks' time. Yep. I was talking earlier about the fact that gas prices are even higher. Yep. Again, today. Yep. Now I know you're one that does believe, as I believe very strongly, that we should be self-sufficient in energy. We don't. Yes, and many things: food production, all kinds of things. We should be setting targets for self-sufficiency. I mean, these are tough times, there's no doubt about it. Um, the first thing we've got to accept, though, these are not domestic issues. Whichever party was in power, these, these situ this situation would be with us right now. Cost of living, energy, supply chains, driving prices, second round effects in terms of uh, um, wage inflation, all this stuff will feed through to inflation 
the Bank of England seems confident it'll get back under control within a couple of years. The I'm less confident. Of, the Bank of England <laughs> didn't think it was going to happen. And yeah, your party right. leader, as recently as last October, was saying, don't worry about inflation. Well, They've all got it wrong. Well... Who gets everything right? No, no, I, sure. Who gets everything right? Sure. And, um, and I thought it was the received wisdom at the time. Bank of England were very clear, and others, other commentators were saying, well, this will top out 4 or 5% and drop back to 2% within a year or two. That's probably not going to happen. No. So internationally, of course, the US has got higher inflation than the UK. Germany's got higher inflation than the UK. The first thing you've got to have is a strong economy. And the great uh, economic news we have is unemployment is incredibly low, 3.9%, below 4%, despite the, the crisis of COVID. It's, it's, been a big, it, I mean, it's been a big surprise. It has. Big surprise. And a lot of that is about management of the economy. Isn't it? I'm not here to just uh, <laughs> but blindly one thing, but one support thing, the government. But, but one thing, Kevin, one thing government can do is decide its own energy policy. We've got these vast gas reserves yep. in Lancashire, and through across into Yorkshire we have. as well. I mean, they're really substantial. Yep. You've, you've argued strongly that we should be going for, whether yep. it's fracking or other yep. methods of gas yep, extraction. That's right. Absolutely. How much stick and abuse have you taken for that? Oh, position? an awful lot. I know. Uh, so my, my constituency is, is beautiful rural yeah. North Yorkshire. 85% yeah. of it is covered by shale gas exploration licenses, and it was when I first came into, poli into Parliament. Went to Pennsylvania, look at it out there. Could this be done in a way that is uh, consistent with that beautiful area of North Yorkshire? Yes, it could, but it is very, very slow. You've got to roll, this stuff rolls out. You have, have to build a well pad, drill 20 wells, and then the next well pad, the next well pad, and we've had the seismicity issues. So it would be 10, 15 years before you're getting decent gas out of the ground. That's not to say you shouldn't start today. Well, others say it could be a year. I don't see that. I mean, we had a site, uh, the first site in the UK was due to be fracked, Kirby and Mispertin in my constituency. The planning consent took two years. Yeah. It, it is very but if, but if slow. Boris Johnson can change the laws on planning consent to build onshore wind farms or nuclear power stations, he can do it for okay. this too. That's possible. Two more issues. A, the seismicity that was caused in the two examples we've had of fracking in the UK. Because, and the energy experts we saw before the Treasury Select Committee quite recently said the geology, which we know the geology is much more and difficult mistakes than were the made, US. weren't they? Yes, but I think there are some logistical problems, some really geological problems that are going to be difficult to overcome. Um, and, of course, politics does come into this. You've got... You know, this is hugely controversial. And it's OK for me, I've got a 25,000 majority to take a bullish line on something. But if you're sat in a 1 or 2,000 majority, you've got fracking in your patch. You've got to look at the political realities of it. And, and, and the lobby against it. Yep. And, and we're increasingly... That's good being told that perhaps Russia was playing a bit of a role in this a few years ago. Yes, I, I understand so. uh, and, and, yeah, and the abuse you take for it is extraordinary. Mm. Yep. Treasury Select Committee, yep. you're there, which as a businessman I'm pleased yep. that you're there. So come on then, what did you make of the spring statement? Just before that, just in terms of gas, let me go, go back. On. North Sea, hit the North Sea with everything we've got. The banks at the go moment, on. which is a sector you're, you're, you know very, uh, very well, the, the, the pulling finance from gas exploration on the basis of their ESG objectives, environmental sustainable goals. It's a complete nonsense. I know. We need that gas. We've got to put forward You and I agree. We've got to be yeah, self-sufficient. Okay. No, we're okay. on that. Yeah, Absolutely. Okay. We, and over, renewables. And over a point, we've agreed on yes. that. Okay. What yeah, about okay. the statement? Which I, I have to say, I thought was a little bit disappointing. Sir Martin Sorrell, who you know is a good judge and inclined to want uh, to believe the best of it, he's disappointed. How, okay. did, you, how did you feel? I thought it was excellent. I, I could. I mean, I was listening. I'm, I've always been the, willing to criticise the, the government. Party line, no, no, that's rubbish. Isn't it? I'm a backbencher. What have I got to lose? I can say anything I want. I vote against the government uh, quite not, not all the time, but now and again. I mean, I looked at it. I mean, what do you do? Who are you going to tax to to compensate other taxpayers for the cost of living crisis? It is an incredibly difficult issue. What he set out is what he calls his tax plan, this new tax plan, which is cutting taxes. Cutting no, taxes no, no, no. on national no, insurance? I'm sorry, I'm okay. sorry, I'm sorry. Taxes are going up. There are tax rises okay. in the pipeline. Yeah. And for him to pretend that he is somehow the low-tax guy when he's putting taxes up, I mean, it, it's nonsense. Well, OK, so you're going to spend another £12 billion pounds a year on the health service. How are you going to do that? Are you, are we, Labour's view, just oh, well, stick it on the desk? That's debt? fine. Then stop okay. telling us you're a low-tax guy. Well, what he said is the, he's going to prioritise... Um, health and social care, to, to cut the backlog, yep. 
of uh, uh, the NHS problems and to properly fund social care for the first time ever in this country, in my knowledge. In my knowledge. Well, how are you going to do it? And what, what he said, if we're going to do that, mm. we're going to pay for it. That's one thing. So he's, he, he has set aside ring fence, if you like, that tax for that purpose. We've the never one had hypothecation of taxes, well, have we? This it's, is what it, we're doing It's now. all a nonsense. Uh, well, okay, it's all a nonsense. Well, we'll see if it is or not. And it has been in the past. You're quite right economically. <laughs> but you but think he's a good chancellor? Uh, I think it's fantastic. Do you? Fantastic. So I think, okay, set that to one side, and that was something we introduced and legislated for last year. But what he's doing now is trying to, he's trying to cut taxes. There's no doubt about it. National insurance going up to 12 and a half. Thou the threshold to twelve hundred thousand three hundred and thirty pounds, good. and it pounds. harmonises with income. Tax. That all makes perfect Fuel sense. Fuel duty, of course, seven p. Income tax. So VAT Fire. on a litre has gone up seven p. And when he's giving us a five p cut, and we're told to be that happy. Well, it's seven p because of market forces. What yeah. can, you're a yeah. free yeah. marketeer, yeah. 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 What can you do yeah. with market forces? Yeah. All I'm saying is, you know, the Irish have cut by seventeen p. All right. Other countries in, in uh, you know, near neighbours in Europe have cut by ten, twelve. It's not a very big cut, is it? Well, I doubt they've increased the threshold for national insurance, which is on top of that. That's £330 a year. That's a big difference. Have they increased national living wage? That's £1,000 a year for somebody who works full-time yep. national living wage. Yep. This is what we've got to try and do, is make work pay. Stop thinking the taxpayer, keep going back to the taxpayer and saying, you're going to have to fund this. Make work pay. Yes, put some money in for the vulnerable households, the billion pounds for the house household support fund. That will help the most vulnerable households. But make work pay. National what? living wage. You, uh, you, you, know, so credit you and I both know, yeah. you and I both know that, that those families in the middle, that big chunk of people in the middle, are, you know, their, their disposable income is going down quite significantly. Right. I agree with you. Government doesn't. It isn't, it isn't all government's fault. I get that totally. A final thought, Kevin on today and on this government. You know, entrepreneurship, uh, the party of small business, uh, the opportunities that Brexit potentially puts on, you know, and the, there are obviously wins and losses when you make a, fun a fundamental change. But actually, there's no connection with entrepreneurship on that front bench, is there? Well, I mean, I, I th Rishi's clearly had a, a business background. But not uh, as an entrepreneur, working with Goldman no, okay. Sachs. It's, no, very, it's very okay. different. Well, uh, there are some voices in the Parliament that have entrepreneurial backgrounds, and, uh, and I'm glad I have had, a, had that kind of background. Yeah. And I think we, we want to encourage more business people to come into <coughs> Parliament. So um, most business people who don't, of course, say, well, I've got too many things that... Might, that people might find out about me from the past yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And, and it's a pay cut. Uh, uh, it's a pay cut. And it's so frustrating. And you, in business, you're used to getting things done pretty quickly. But I used to, uh, the message should go out, we want business people to come into politics. I think if you look at some of the things we get wrong, it's usually about implementation. It's, the policies can be quite good, but imp implementation mm. is not always that good. The implementation is far more important than changing the policy all the time or legislation. <laughs> Let's get more people in Parliament who know how to get things done. That's absolutely vital. Okay. I think that's what uh, people who have been entrepreneurs can help with. Kevin, absolute pleasure having you on Pleasure Talking Pines and yes. for being a very good sport. <laughs> Thanks very much. Cheers.